Thank you so thank you so much, Candice, for that introduction, um, everybody. The Linux Foundation does such a great job with these. I love being here doing these. I, I don't know how many times I've done this with y'all, but it's a lot. So, um, you know, before I get started, just a couple of my own logistics. Uh, first of all, that's me up there. If you want to follow me on Twitter or anything, I'm just James, J-A-Y-M-C-E. Um, you know, people do like to understand um, what's the level of content going to be in this in this particular session. I think it's intermediate. You know, we're going to get into the details of, you know, how you architect software and how you architect an application to actually make it serverless and, and dive into some of the details. And maybe hopefully there's some, some good advice for you to actually pull away to think about how you can architect your own applications to be serverless. Because honestly, I'm kind of a, I'm a believer in this whole thing. Um, you know, I, so, I, I, you know, my God, I haven't updated this. It's not, there's not two of us, there's just one of us today. So we is, I guess, me and the mouse in my pocket, but I, I'm not a database expert. I am curious. I love this stuff. I love to talk about these things. And, and the goal here today is give you all basically a high level context of, of kind of how to think about, you know, the way that we went through this process to hopefully help you um, think through your own process. And as, that, as Candace noted, uh, please do ask questions. I'll have the QA panel up the whole time uh, while I'm presenting. Uh, and I'll try to get to questions in line as we talk, if you have them. Um, and, and I do love questions along the way. So last thing is I am with a company called Cockroach Labs. Uh, you know, love it or hate it, people don't forget the name of it. Uh, we are named after the mighty cockroach. In fact, our uh, our O'Reilly book, thank God, has a cockroach on it, uh, which is good. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, we 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 are the we are a vendor behind a database um, called CockroachDB, which is really a, a kind of a modern cloud database that was really architected to you know to be naturally resilient, uh, to scale very easily, basically to be a modern cloud database and, and instrument and use a lot of kind of cloud native principles. Um, a lot of the things that, that I've learned in working within the CNCF for the last five to six years really are, are dictated and are actually outlined and, and coded into, into Cockroach uh, DB. If anybody's ever interested in looking at our code base, it is open. Uh, you can look through there. I'd like to think it's a PhD in distributed systems. Uh, it's all in Go. Um, it's, it's a very interesting code base. So um, that was just a little bit before we get started. So as we go through this, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. This is a kind of a, a webinar of three parts. We'll do high level. We'll drill down and we'll get into some some deeper detail at the end. Um, but please do ask questions. Um, you know, when I think of this concept of serverless, and I'm, I have, I, I hope you're all on just to, you know, as a, at a high level because you're curious and kind of where this is going. But you know, as as the concept of serverless to me, I, I just was not a believer in it about a year and a half ago. Maybe it's the implementations of serverless that I saw in the market and some of the tooling that. That was out there. I just was not a believer in it. Um, and, and the closer and closer I get to it, the, the, the more and more I'm actually a believer in it. And I and I think if if I kind of think of like what helps me understand this is, you know, if if we take the concept of service and we apply it to things, things start to make a whole lot of interesting, right? So the same way we took a, a telephone and we applied the concept of wireless to it, well, it just made it more convenient. It made it more capable. Right. And I think we could do the, the same thing to to serverless, right? We could take basically say, you know, how do we take this concept and apply it to our applications and to our, our backend infrastructure? Um, how, do, how do we apply this in the cloud? You know, can we get this, this improved capabilities, better convenience? Uh, can we be more efficient? And I think that is, to me, the, the premise of what serverless mean. I mean, we have lots of things. We have serverless functions. We have lots of different things. But they're all implementing this kind of the serverless, the, this, this, this paradigm. Um, and when I think about paradigm, I really think of five things. I think, you know, little to no manual server management by anybody. Let's, let's automate as much as we can. Maybe there's one person, you know, managing, you know, thousands or a farm or a fleet of servers for people. Um, but, but let's just limit that, right? Uh, let's not, let's not have, you know, people who interact with your, your piece of infrastructure or your software do that, you know, let's let it scale um, elastically. Uh, let's make it a service. Uh, you know, like one of these kind of core distributed systems things, you know, is it, is it inherently fault tolerant? Is it, it does it have high available, the high availability like baked into it? Is it always available and, and, and there for you? And then I think most, most importantly for a lot of us is, you know, if we think about serverless, I don't want to go and buy an EC2 instance or, or, or at least a, a, a VM in the cloud somewhere. I just want to use what I use and I don't want to be billed for you know, the excess compute cycles that I'm not actually using. And I think about serverless, I think those five kind of core principles, if we can apply them to our own software stack, things get really interesting because we can actually start to deliver software in a different way. Now, today, people think about serverless as like, you know, serverless compute, like, 
I love Google Cloud Run. I think it's really cool. Fargate or serverless functions where like it's Lambda or cloud functions and Netlify and Vercel all fit into this, right? Or there's like these emerging kind of functions as a service platforms where they're taking all of this and pulling it together. And it's like this end to end kind of app development platform. And, and, and this is great. This is a really, really great first step into, into serverless and helping to define the space and, and popularize it. But if I really think about this, I think what, what's happened here is we've taken a concept of, you know, compute, we've taken a concept of like these, these application functions and we've applied serverless to it. Um, there's a whole lot more work to do. And I think we can actually make our own application serverless. And I think about this, the database, and that's what we're doing. Well, there's a couple more requirements because I, I don't think serverless, and, and this actually applies to everything, not just the database. I don't think serverless should be limited to a single AZ or a single region. I think serverless should actually be infrastructureless. It should be, you know, free for geographic scale as well. These things should be available to, available across the entire planet. And with a database, well, you know, you start to get into the weird things about transactional guarantees. You know, the, how do you implement SQL in the context of this? Um, how do you auto scale a database? It's kind of difficult. Where is the location of data uh, based on what's going on? How, how quickly people access things? Um, you know, is, is state preserved? Um, and ultimately, I think this, this concept of infrastructure is really, really interesting and really, really important. And so how did we do this, right? How do we take kind of one of these things and actually apply it? And when I think about, you know, like, let's go back a second. I mean, we're doing this to, to Cockroach TV, and I'm going to go through kind of how we did this from an execution point of view and then how we do storage of data and these sort of things. And, and, and if you think about this, there's several solutions that are doing this out there. I think, I think people are moving in this direction because we do see the value in the core principles of what serverless is applied to various different solutions. I, you know, I was just on the, the website for ClickHouse earlier and, you know, the same basic architecture around ephemeral compute and persistent storage um, is the same thing implemented there. And so I, there's something here, this, this pattern of application architecture is definitely emerging. And that's what I want to talk through, right? So if we think of a database, um, any database, so any DBMS, um, there's really kind of, three layers. There's a language in which it speaks. There's storage at the bottom, because ultimately the point of a database is I'm going to write things to disk, right? And then there's this execution layer of things that you can do with that data uh, via the language. Now, in Cockroach, it's a little different. Like, we, it's still SQL. It's still the language is, is hasn't changed. It's still, you know, kind of uh, the, the SQL syntax that you would expect out of any Postgres database, right? But, but underneath the covers, we're doing things very differently, because we are using kind of a distributed system. So we're we're distributing the execution of transactions, right? We're, we're replicating and distributing data across, you know, lots of different things from a storage point of view. So the, the kind of these middle layers really start to change when you start to think about distributed systems. Um, and distributed systems are really going to optimize, you know, the compute that it has uh, to, to, to its behest to actually go and execute what you want to do. Now, for me, uh, you know, when we start to think about how do we make any application serverless, and it's not just the database here, to me, it's all about finding that divide in your software and your architecture stack. You know, what is the what is that point where you know everything above the line is ephemeral? It doesn't need state. It, it, it's a stateless components of what you're doing. And if you think about execution of a query, I don't really need. Maybe there's like temporary state things that happen between you know various different kind of in a query plan. But but even in that case, I mean, it's 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 ephemeral. It's it's going to go away at the end of the of, at the end of the execution of of whatever it is it's doing. Uh, underneath that, underneath that line is the things that need to persist, the things that actually we are writing a disk, like the, the data can't change, it can't just go away, especially with the database, right? So if we can find the line between ephemeral compute and persistent storage, that's the line you want to draw when you're starting to think about making your own application serverless. And let me just go through kind of how we do that and how we actually use this as, a, as an architectural kind of piece. Um, first for the execution layer, and then I'll talk about what we're doing in storage. It's a little bit deeper into the architecture of Cockroach in particular, but it will give you some sense of kind of how to how to make things multi-tenant, how to how to do this persistent. So in, in Cockroach today, you know, when I deploy a, a database, I can run it here. I am running it across three different pods in Kubernetes. I have three nodes of Cockroach. Um, it basically acts as one logical database. It's a single logical database across, you know, multiple different instances. I could ask any one of these nodes for data. Every one of them is an endpoint. I simply put a load balancer in front of this and I write data and I read data. And these three nodes are safely just kind of all work together and, and, and deliver um, the capability of, of a relational database. Now, what we've done in Cockroach is we said, hey, look at where is this, where's that line, right? Where's ephemeral compute and distributed storage? And what we've done is said the storage and replication part, like 
how we actually distribute and where we put this data um, is different than what's happening up above. Up above is basically really the 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 you know what's ephemeral. Uh, none of this needs to be there. If it, if it just goes away, it's okay, right? Um, yeah, it, of course, if not in the middle of a transaction, then that's a wholly other thing. But the SQL is separated from the storage. And if I think about that, the SQL execution is separated from the storage. So now I have this virtual cluster living on top of you know storage and replication. We've actually taken our software and created kind of two binaries, if you will. One binary kind of studs out the storage and replication part. The storage and replication studs out the SQL and execution distribution. And then what we've done is we've redefined the software stack so that they communicate to each other in a, in a really intelligent way. So we have this we have a shared CockroachDB storage only cluster, and we can run these virtual clusters on top, right? And and each virtual cluster that lives on top of this shared storage basically is its own size. You know, my tenant one has a fairly you know intense application, with lots and lots of ex, you know transactions a second. Maybe cluster two, it's just a prototype where it's maybe a couple transactions a minute or whatever that is, well, for three is like super, super heavy traffic. We can spin up more SQL pods based on the amount of traffic that's coming in. So we can scale basically separately because before I, I would have had to scale this entire stack. Now using the storage, this shared storage layer, I can actually scale separately across the ephemeral compute and, 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 the, and the persistent storage underneath. So what does this look like? I mean, so basically what we'll do is, you know, we, when, we spend it, when, we, when we spin these things up, this is basically an instance of cockroach, again, running in a pod. And so we'll spin up, you know, tenant one across three different available zones. Maybe tenant two just goes into AZ2. You know, tenant three is going to go across, you know, all three different AZs so that if an entire, you know, AZ fails, we still have the data. Because actually, when we write data, we're writing data two or three times. And these pods are oblivious to kind of where the data lives. And they don't even matter, the, the execution pods on top. But in order to do this, we had to actually introduce a new layer into our software. Uh, we had to introduce a proxy and a proxy actually basically what it does is it has a manifest of all the pods that are distributed across the entirety of the system and it knows which tenant belongs to which pod that way when a request comes through for say tenant one into the proxy over in in, in the az1 it knows that it can go to one of these three different pods to actually execute that query because remember every node in cockroach can service a reader or write and so every node is an endpoint so you need this kind of traffic cop or a proxy basically to actually understand you know who owns each of the the pieces of ephemeral compute so that's kind of a big lesson learned up front for us right now scale in 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 a in a database is is quite interesting um you know when i think about scale i think of you know three different layers of scale i think about storage size of the database how many how many petabytes is your database like you know how many how many records are stored in that thing i also think about you know transactional volume of data uh, and, and how much, you know, that's, a, that's another kind of, you know, vector of, 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 of scale. And I think the third scale is geographic scale. You know, can I actually scale this thing across the whole planet, across multiple different regions? Well, transactional scale in a, in a serverless database is, is also very quite different, right? Um, in a serverless database, the entire concept is, well, if I don't have any traffic, I don't want any ephemeral compute running so that I can actually just scale down to zero, right? Um, however, if I have some sort of like intense usage time, like maybe eight in the morning, everybody uses my application because they all wake up and do whatever it is. Can I can I accommodate those spikes in traffic to have you know my my Pima ninety nine latencies all within a certain range? And and can the cluster just do that? Can it just scale up and down this ephemeral compute to meet the needs of what you need to do? And, and most importantly, can it spin down to zero so that I'm not paying when I'm not using anything all the way down to zero? And then start very instantly when it comes back, right? And so this is all accomplished using these kind of ephemeral pods. And what we built is this thing called an auto scale. And an auto scale is basically is monitoring the CPU load across each of the pods. And then it calculates two metrics, the average CPU usage and the peak CPU usage um, across five minutes. And, and then what we have, we have a pretty simple algorithm um, that basically looks at this, this usage over the past five minutes. It's, you know, we, we can tune it, uh, these sort of things at times. Basically, what it says, hey, man, if my CPU usage is going up, spin up new SQL pods and assign them to that particular tenant. If it's going down, then kill off pods that I don't need to run or put them back into a pool, right? Um, and, and so this, this is kind of those, one of those key things. And the autoscaler, well, while it has a fair amount of complexity, it's pretty simple at its top layer in terms of how it's actually doing this. So if you're going to build something that's serverless yourself, you got to start thinking about you know, what does the autoscaler look like for you? Maybe it's measuring, for us, it was CPU usage. It was pretty easy to do. 
Um, it was a direct kind of correlation to how busy the transactions were within the entirety of the system. But maybe it's something within your software as well. Uh, and so like thinking through your own auto scaler and how these things might work, um, it's kind of one of those things. It's just this, this made sense for us. And so we can scale up, we can scale down based on average CPU and peak CPU of that particular cluster. Okay, so how does this work? So I have my picture where I have tenant run. Uh, it's running in three different availability zones. I have my proxy layer, the load balancer sitting in front of these, these three different AZs. And tenant one is running at steady state. And the steady state capacity is about halfway up the, the, the curve for them in the upper left-hand corner there. Um, and so basically three pods, three uh, ephemeral pods can actually handle the traffic, uh, the, the normal traffic. Now, what I have in each one of these AZs, and this is just a different cluster across all of them, each one of these AZs is I have hot pods, which basically are instances of cockroach that have not been assigned to anybody. They aren't in, they're in the manifest as unassigned, basically. So these, this proxy across the top, the four versions of the proxy, they all share this manifest and they all understand what's going on. Um, and and they, 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 in real time, it's guaranteed correct, it's guaranteed consistent. And so the manifest actually understands what's going on within that cluster. And so we have these hot pods, which are basically instances of cockroach that are unassigned. And we have pods that are out there that are assigned to a particular tenant. So if the auto scaler measures that, oh gosh, you know, there's a spike in traffic over the last five minutes, I need to increase the pods. It can basically take one of these hot pods, assign it to a tenant, and instantly we have much more ephemeral compute. You know, we've we've improved by 33% our ephemeral compute for that particular cluster. Still living on the same storage, and the storage is just for the storage is storage is going to expand based on basically how much space it needs. And that that's a wholly different scale issue, and that's, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, that that doesn't change all the time, whereas you know this this ephemeral compute does. And so we basically just take a hot pod, we assign it to a tenant, we change things in the manifest. Good way, way to go. Um, and now we have actually excess capacity. And so when things come back to normal, um, and our auto scaler realizes it doesn't need as much compute, it's going to bring it all. It's going to bring down that that pod, throw it back into the pool. Uh, and then say there's no traffic, middle of the night, nobody's using this, tenant one, there's no traffic. Um, it's gonna spin all of those kind of ephemeral pods down. And, and we're really careful in terms of how many hot pods we have going on at any one time to basically maintain enough um, you know, sensibility to you know, when new uh, requests are gonna come through or not. So we, we spin things up, spin things down pretty quickly, used out of, out of that pool of pods, but we'll spin down um, pods if there's no usage of things within a clusters, within this big shared cluster. And so ultimately, this is how we actually go through it. We, we have this auto scaler kind of dealing these sort of things. Now, um, you know, in the end, uh, you know, things do come back very quickly and tenant one has a query all of a sudden, well, I can go and get one of these hot pods and bring these things back very, very quickly, you know, under hundred milliseconds, closer to 50 milliseconds, you know, we're working always uh, really hard on, on making that come back really quick because you want, don't want any sort of delay. So, Ultimately, what we've done is we've kind of re-architected our software stack and using Kubernetes, we're actually able to kind of scale up, scale down based on need for that particular, um, based on need for that particular application. Um, it's pretty clean, it's pretty clear, it's pretty, it, it, it's, it's pretty elegant um, and, it, and it's working pretty well for us. Right now, um, we have one cluster of, of CockroachDB serverless and AWS, we have one other in GCP. We have over 30,000 clusters running uh, within, within our environments today. So it, it's a little heavy on AWS versus GCP. I won't get too deep into the numbers. Maybe it's two to, you know, two thirds, one third. I, I, what, regardless, it doesn't matter. You could imagine the, the amount of, of SQL pods that are running across you know, this distributed storage. And so lots of different, there's over 30,000 tenants across the, the two. Um, and that is really just kind of two instances of, of basically this, this persistent layer with lots of different instances of these kind of ephemeral pods living on top, you know, 30,000 of them across, across the two clusters. Now, um, eventually we'll make that thing multi-region as well. So it's not just AZs. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We're, we're actually playing with that. We have versions of it. If you really want to play with it, just reach out to us, go to our public Slack, or you can email me, Jim at Cockroach Labs, and I'll, I'll get you moving on that as well. We can actually start to do serverless across multiple different regions, which had presented a whole other set of problems. Okay, so we talked about kind of this ephemeral compute, which is kind of above the line. Um, what about below the line? How did we make our distributed storage, um, our, our replication distributed, and, and how we store data multi-tenant? Because if I'm going to have the persistent storage layer, that that to us is multi-tenant. There's lots of data down there. In fact, the 30,000 clusters, those are all sharing in one big storage cluster. So 
how do we kind of, you know, firewall off that data between various different users and different applications and make it kind of be tied to particular tenants within the cluster itself. And that that's going to take a little bit of a dive into kind of how Cockroach works at the storage layer, which I hope is also valuable to you as well, because this is kind of one of those core things within distributed systems that gets really, really interesting as well. And so let's go down below the storage. Let's go down into to the persistent layer. So above the line was ephemeral, below the line is the, the persistent layer. Okay, so let's dive in. So in, in Cockroach database, um, all data is stored as this kind of monolithic logical key space. And, and that, that, that key space is, is sorted kind of lexicographically by key. So if you look at this, like here's a dogs table, here's all the entries, here's the PK's name or something, you know, you'll see it's all alphabetically in here. Right. And so it's not exactly like this. There's a K, which is the key, and then a value, which is a name. But you know, you can understand. I mean, it's this huge kind of sorted, sorted set of, of KV underneath the covers. Now, Cockroach to you and me, the developer, is just a SQL. It's SQL. It's a relational database. It looks like Postgres, smells like Postgres, feels like Postgres. Um, you know, the service, you get a you get an instance of it running pretty quickly. So we as developers communicate in SQL underneath the covers. We're using KV to actually provide value of the stack within the database itself. I need to dive into that to actually show you how we made the storage layer um, uh, multi-tenant, okay? And so for each table that's stored in Cockroach, we actually break down the, the key space, uh, the storage layer down to these 512 megabit ranges. Now, we've chosen this amount because it kind of amortizes indexing. It, it allows us to kind of move things very quickly. You know, we've really optimized around this. I know when I started, I think we were at 256. So we've got really good at basically cleaning up databases, moving data around. And so these ranges, you could think of them as shards. Uh, and, and this is the way we basically do kind of automation of sharding as well. But if you're gonna do this, right, you're gonna break down a table into to, to different pieces. You need an index structure so you can find the data within the cluster itself within that storage. Really. So we do that. It's, it works very much like a B tree if you're familiar with you know, how to implement that algorithm. And then what we're using underneath the covers um, to actually you know, manage all of this is, is an algorithm called RAFT. And RAFT is a distributed consensus algorithm, which really allows us to provide these kind of like, writes are all gonna happen together and I'm gonna have consistent reads no matter what happens on this, on this data. Now, if you're new to distributed systems, I would highly recommend um, reading up on RAFT. Um, there's another concept we use in distributed transactions called MVCC, but and, and that's also equally interesting, but but really Raft is kind of one of these core kind of distributed system systems. Uh, uh, algorithms is really important. So Raft is uh, really comprised of a set of replicas. So on the right hand side, you'll see this kind of blue set of data. You could think of that as this kind of the, this middle range that's here: Lady, Lula, Muddy, and Petey. I have three copies of that, and I'm going to write that copies of that data on three physical different instances. And that is a raft group. Those three ranges are all going to communicate with each other to make sure it's correct and make sure that they're aligned across these three instances. Now, it's an odd number. It could be five times, it could be seven, it could be nine, some odd number of replicas, because eventually we're going to use this to get quorum rights. Because two of three, if two of three are in agreement, the third one is 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 out of favor and it will come along to actually work with the with the rest of the raft group. Okay. Now it does all this, it's chatty, there's coalesced heartbeats, time is very important in this concept. Um, but there's a special concept, a special replica, if you will, and that is the, the raft leader. Uh, and in the raft protocol, you elect a leader, and the leader is basically responsible for all rights to the entirety of the group. Um, the leader, if you if you ask the reader for the data, you're going to be is certain to get the authoritative, you know, up to date uh, uh, information. Now in Cockroach, you can talk to the leader, and by default, it's going to go talk to the leader to get that data. You can also do something called follower reads, which relaxes some of the consistency uh, demands. And so maybe I asked the, the top you know, replica here for the data, but I'm using a follower read. It's okay, right? It just really depends on your query and you want, what, you, what you want to accomplish, right? And so this, this, this RAF leader is really what allows us to get this kind of atomic replication. So like if I talk to the RAF leader and say, hey, here's my data, go write it to the replicas, uh, only the RAF leader can actually answer back like I'm good. And, and this really is what we use to basically ensure consistency across the database as well. Okay, so if you want to learn more about Raft and distributed consensus, um, the secret lives of data.com, I would go there, check it out. They have a really great graphic and explains how Raft works uh, much better than I could ever could. I've sent a lot of people to that website and I think it's 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 really, really great. So, okay, so when we place data in, let's, let's go back to the serverless part, right? So when we place data into Cockroach, 
basically I'm going to take my wrap group. I'm going to write the three copies across three nodes, the blue across three nodes, and the red across three nodes. And you know, there's a lot more smarts in here. We can actually write based on workload and all these, you know, how much how much you know traffic is going through that range and whatnot. But but ultimately, what we're doing is we're basically just writing this data across you know multiple different you know physical instances. Now again, let's come back again to this monolithic key space, right? Where we have this huge key store, um, and and when we what we're doing is we're actually exposing this as SQL. So let's come back up another layer, right? At the language, it's actually SQL. So the way this works is basically all tables have a primary key and the key is basically what we're sorting on and the value is is the value like, like, let's get into examples the best way to actually do this so here's a table it's a dog's table it has id name and weight there's some table entries over on the right hand side uh, you'll see you know here's carl weighs 10.1 pounds i guess right um and so for each of these records when we convert it to kv underneath the cover so you don't have to see any of this within your, your data. I mean, you, you don't see any of this, actually. This is all happening on the covers. What we're doing is we're saying, like, look at, let's take the, the, the name of the table, which is dog. Let's take the primary key, which is, say, 34. And let's take the value name and write it. Let's take the primary, let's take the table, primary key, value, and write it. And what you're seeing is this entire list right here is, is sorted. And it's really sorted by key. And if you look at, like, the first two kind of pieces here, the table and the, and the, and the key, the primary key, that's really what it's allowing us to do this here. And so we have this huge range of set, and this is really what allows us to do some interesting things. We can overload this with a column name. This is what allows us to do something called geopartitioning. It allows us to, to write data to certain, certain places. But I think of this huge monolithic kind of key graph set, I'm, I'm setting these things up in ranges. Well, all of the data in this part of the table is in various different pieces, right? Okay, so what we had to do to actually make our, our cockroach, our, our storage layer, um, multi-tenant is all we had to do is we had to take the name of a tenant and put it up front. So now if you sort everything, well, all of this tenant's data is together, all of this tenant's data is together, all of this tenant's data is together, right? And this huge lexicographically ordered key fair set, right? Like we, we now have ranges that are tied to particular tenants. And now when you search for data, that tenant is the only person that can access that data with that particular key. And so not only have we been able to basically break out these ranges and this huge massive back end into, into these individual little pieces, but we now have data that's going to be, you know, restricted to particular uh, tenant, right? So it's going to restrict this, this secure access to, to the ranges. The table belongs to the tenant and the data belongs to the tenant. So underneath the covers, what we're doing is, is actually making the, the storage layer multi-tenant as well. So above the layer, ephemeral compute, we use Kubernetes to scale up and scale down with an auto scaler below the layer in persistent storage. What we're doing is we're using KV to basically implement a multi-tenant storage layer for, for people, okay? Um, so Cockroach CV, um, those, those are the kind of, those are the two big concepts. And I, it's actually pretty simple and pretty straightforward. I think it's interesting and fun to think about that in our own application. So, you know, Cockroach CV, we do have a serverless version today. Um, we've taken all the beauty of our database. It's active, active. We can do geo partitioning. It's fully managed service. It's a relational database. Um, and if you want to go try Cockroach, really the best way to do this is via our serverless uh, deployment model, which it delivers this elastic scale. Uh, we can spin clusters down to zero, so you don't have to pay. Uh, it is multi-tenant. Most importantly, it's consumption based. And so we really feel this kind of like ultimately will be this kind of you know, this frictionless SQL API in the cloud eventually. Um, if we have endpoints around the whole planet, we, we get to multi-region. Because it allows developers to basically focus on what you want to focus on, right? Is familiar and dire, you know, this familiar development environment, but don't worry about scale. Don't worry about downtime. Um, you know, eliminate the concepts of ops out of your life and, and basically go cloud, right? I, I think that's kind of the big takeaway here. We think about the the core principles of serverless, we're, we're, we're delivering all, all those within the database itself. Ooh, what's going on? Okay, oh, here we go. So serverless uh, is, is available now. It's not even beta. It actually came out of beta uh, last week, actually. It's GA. Um, right now it is single region. It'll be multi-region fairly soon. Um, it's free to use, uh, no credit card required. Uh, it's a free up to five gigabytes of storage, 250 million request units. And I'll come back to, to request units. Most importantly, you can set this spend limit, which is down here at the bottom of the screen, so that you aren't going to get a surprise. One of the problems with serverless is it's like, oh my God, the thing just went out of control and was pegged, and I got a bill at the end of the month. We, we actually kind of, we, we temper that, and we allow you to set a spend limit. So if it's two bucks, you never pay more than two bucks a month. 
or, or 10 bucks or 100 or whatever it is that you want to do. Now, this is forever free. Um, you can get a database up and running in seconds using this thing. Uh, I know one of my peers, uh, Charlie, just Charlie just created a cluster. It's pretty easy to get going. He had his mom create a serverless cluster and connect to it. Uh, it's kind of a funny video that we just came out with uh, recently. If you want to go check it out, I know it's on our Twitter account today. Or just look up Cockroach DB serverless and mom. Maybe that'd be a good query. Um, but but yeah, it's pretty easy to get going. So basically, you have an instance of Postgres uh, in in seconds uh, and for free. Now these request units. A request unit is basically the the abstraction of a query, like a transaction. Because a transaction is SQL database, not all transactions are kind of equal, right? Some transactions are, you know, select star from customer is very different than select star from customer where last name is this and first name is this and, you know, addresses are blah, blah, you, you, whatever. You mean, you can, you can understand each query is very different. And so we, we've we actually abstract that out into some color request unit. So, and, and you know, we'll, we'll be able to handle kind of, you know, a, a certain amount of volume over the course of the whole month, or maybe it's spiky, it's cyclic, you know, day and night, it's going to happen. Maybe it's just at the beginning of the month, you have a huge spike in traffic. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to actually uh, a throttle back so you have enough uh, bandwidth for the rest of the month based on, you know, what's being used in any one moment in time, right? And so basically the the, the volume underneath that curve based on what your, what your usage pattern is, is always going to be about 250 million uh, request units. Uh, again, you know, engage us in our public Slack channel if you want to learn more about request units, what that actually means. Um, I know that we have some documentation on that. Um, all very interesting, but I think as you think about your own service and what you're going to do, you know, how do you actually start to do this kind of consumption-based billing? What's that going to mean? So, so great. Um, thank you, everybody. I, you know, there were no questions. I, you know, this is a fairly straightforward topic. Um, I hope it's valuable for people. Um, we love talking about these things. Um, you know, we're pretty proud of ourselves as a company in terms of like what we're building. We, we do think this is the future of, of where a lot of things are going. Um, you know, I'm excited to get to Detroit in a couple of weeks, uh, you know, to be in the booth and actually engage with everybody again, um, you know, for, for coupon. Uh, North America. Uh, we'll be there for booth 26. Uh, you come by, get a demo, get a free t-shirt. Uh, we're going to have a happy hour uh, while we're there. So we'd love to buy you a beer and hang out. Um, but with that, I just want to make sure that y'all have a chance to, to, to come and meet us. Um, there were no questions along the way. Um, I, I, I guess I'm happy and sad about that, but I do hope this was valuable for you all. Um, you know, we do like to provide stuff, that, content that's not just about what we're doing, but hopefully it's useful for you in terms of the way you, you think about your own application architecture and your stack and, and how you're thinking about serverless. But you know, I've really learned a lot about this over the last couple of years, and I, I'm pretty excited about it. So um, with that, I just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time. Um, if you did want questions, again, our public Slack channel is a great place to go. Uh, do provide feedback on webinars along the way, uh, because gosh, we, we sure do we sure do like that. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Candice, and I want to thank everybody for, for taking the time today. Oh, wait, there was one, there was one question. Um, there was somebody who was asking a question of, do we have, you know, TPCH or TPCDS performance benchmarks for Cockroach DB. Um, we do TPCC nightly. Uh, you know, we're 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 playing with TPCE right now as well. Uh, H and DS. Uh, I don't think we've run those two uh, to the to the person who's asking a question. But if you go to Cockroach DB and you go into our docs and um, you just do a search for performance, uh, you'll see some of our benchmark numbers uh, published there. Um, one of the things that we, you know, we we compare ourselves to other solutions, of course, but, you know, benchmarks for us, we, we would very rarely publish a benchmark about another database because it's kind of difficult to be an expert in your own thing and everything else, right? So, um, you know, we're doing everything that we can to, to push the TPC benchmarks into the distributed world. Because right now, the problem with benchmarks in, in TPC uh, and TPCC in particular is that it's not distributed. Uh, and so we do a lot of work to basically do that. And so look for work from us that that's going to be talking a lot about, you know, public benchmarks around um, how we think about these things in distributed systems, because I think we're living in a new world of uh, is, those benchmarks haven't been updated in really quite some time. So, all right. So I will, I'm going to give it like two seconds just in case there's no more questions. Dramatic, heavy pause. All right. Well, um, if there's no more questions. Um, I want to, again, thank everybody for taking their time today. And I want to pass it back to Candice, our, 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 our gracious host, uh, to send you all off. Thank you, Candice.
Thank you so much, Jim, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.